Okay, so kind of our very last topic for organic chemistry and actually for our entire chemistry unit is just kind of some applications of the different properties of these different hydrocarbons that we've been talking about. So different hydrocarbons uh, have different properties, right? That shouldn't surprise you too much, right? You probably know that propane that you use in a barbecue uh, won't power your, via your car, right? Which runs mostly on octane, okay? So they have different properties. They do similar things, but they do it in a different way. And so that all comes down to the chemical structure of them, okay? So one of the big important things here, one of the big applications we're going to look at here is boiling point. So I want you to think back to uh, science 7 is the first time you hear it, but you kind of hear it a lot in science, right? Something called the particle model of matter. So you might remember the big thing about it is that particles are always moving. Even in a solid where it might not look like it's moving, those particles are moving. They're just kind of vibrating, right? So if that's a solid... They are moving, they're just kind of vibrating next to each other. So these little red lines are kind of vibration lines as they wiggle back and forth. Okay, how do we turn it into a liquid? Well, how do you turn solid water, let's say ice, into a liquid? Well, you know that, you heat it up, right? So if you add heat, what you actually do is you make heat is a form of energy, and so that heat energy turns into kinetic energy, motion of the particles, and they move faster and faster and faster. And eventually, if they start moving fast enough, they're gonna end up as a liquid right as ice heats up its particles move faster and faster and they get further apart and you end up with a liquid where they're kind of now moving around a little bit more quick they're kind of slipping past each other as they slide along okay now you keep heating up that liquid you've melted the ice you've got water you put it in a pot and you keep heating it up and you keep heating it up and you keep heating it up and the particles move faster and faster and faster and faster and eventually what ends up happening it boils so what is boiling really? Boiling means turning from a liquid into a gas, right? And when water boils and it becomes a gas, you start to see the steam come off, right? So once it's a gas, the particles are now, you've heated them up so much, they have a lot of energy, they are flying around. They don't even have to stay together anymore, they'll actually come out of the pot that you're boiling them in, right? So they're now they're flying around like crazy, right? Okay, so just to go over the idea of what is boiling, Boiling is turning something from a liquid to a gas. And what do we say we had to do? We had to get them so far apart. We had to move the particles so far apart that they end up completely flying around like crazy. So before we really get into it, again, boiling just means turning from a liquid to a gas. That's all boiling is at the end of the day, turning something from a liquid to a gas. Okay, what does that have to do with the different kinds of hydrocarbons? Well, it turns out that the reason we have to heat them up, you have to put energy in to split them up, is that there are little forces kind of between the molecules that make up a substance, right? So, but for example, if we go back to water, there's forces between the water molecules that kind of hold them together, forces that don't let them spread apart. Now, if we heat it up, we can put in enough energy to break those forces, and then we have a liquid, okay? Why are some things easier to boil than others? Well, the bigger the molecule, the stronger those forces are. So the forces that stop it from going to a liquid to a gas actually just depend on how big the molecule is. Think of it like trying to break up a group of big NFL players, right? A bunch of huge people, right? Versus trying to break up a group of kindergartners playing on the playground, right? You're gonna have a lot easier time if you put in the energy, you can split up a bunch of kindergartners pretty easily. Good luck splitting up a big huddle of NFL players. Okay, that's kind of the same idea here. So we won't do the graph. Um, you can do that on your own if you want to kind of get the visual of it. But I want you to look at this. What do you notice? Methane, remember, how many carbons does meth mean? Meth means one, right? F2, prop three. So as we get more and more and more carbons, look at what happens to the boiling point. So to turn methane from a liquid to a gas, it only needs to hit this temperature, negative 164. So you will never anywhere naturally on earth see methane that is not a gas, right? Same goes for ethane, unless you're on like in Antarctica on like the coldest day that's ever been recorded, it will always be a gas, right? Propane, you can actually see propane. Sometimes in Fort McMurray, you would have propane that would turn to a liquid. And then as it gets higher, you start to see, okay, so at normal temperatures, pentane would actually be a liquid, right? It would have to be a very hot day to boil pentane naturally. Okay, hexane, heptane. Notice as the more carbons we add, the higher the boiling point gets, right? So these guys down here are like the NFL players, okay? These guys up here are like the kindergartners. You can break them up with one hand, 
Down here, you're going to have to put a lot more effort in if you're going to break them apart and do this, turn it from a liquid to a gas, okay? So essentially, what does this whole idea kind of boil down to? <laughs> Pun intended, okay? Uh, more carbons equals higher boiling point, okay? If I were to sum this up in one, what's the big idea? That's it. The more carbon something has, the harder it's going to be to make it boil, to make it turn from a liquid to a gas. All right, doesn't sound that exciting at first, right? What's the big deal? Okay, cool, more carbons, higher boiling point. Well, this is actually one of the key things that allows us to refine crude oil, as you may know in our neck of the woods, right? That's pretty important to us, right? So Alberta's well says in the refining of crude oil is an important part of the Canadian economy. Canadian economy. So what is crude oil? Crude oil is essentially, it's mostly what we extract, right? It is a, it's kind of hydrocarbon soup, right? It's just a mixture of many different sizes Of hydrocarbons. So you've got little guys in there, you've got big guys in there, right? You've got mess, Fs, all the way up to your decks and then beyond into the ones we even talked about into your uh, icoses and your triacons, right? I don't even know what the prefixes are after a while, but a mixture of small hydrocarbons and huge hydrocarbons. So crude oil, what are you going to run with crude oil? Well, you can run a lot of things with the parts that make up crude oil, but if you put crude oil into most machines, you're going to break that machine because like we talked about earlier, right? Your barbecue does not want gasoline. If you put gasoline and go in your bar barbecue, you are going to be in trouble, right? If you live to tell the tale. If you put propane into the average car, right? That is not going to go very well either. So different machines need different hydrocarbons to burn to run properly. And so how do we take this crude oil, this hydrocarbon soup, this mixture of a whole bunch of them, and how do we actually pull out the ones we want so that they can go where they need to go? It actually comes pretty much down to boiling points. We'll get to that in a sec, okay? But different hydrocarbons do different things, right? So some of them even go on for not fuels, right? Like things like plastics, medicines, cosmetics, clothing, all of those can be made from hydrocarbons and many other things, okay? Even historically, tar, or pitch, right, was used to seal canoes. Okay, animal oils and fats have been used for centuries, millennia even, as fuel for burning, as fuel for light sources or warmth. Okay, all of these kind of things that we're talking about, including putting it in your car to go, right, involve a similar reaction. If they all look like this, you take a hydrocarbon, right, notice that's a hydrocarbon, X and Y just means pick a number, right, so C7, H16, that could be the thing you put in there, heptane, right? Or CH4, that could be whatever you do. But they all react with oxygen to make carbon dioxide and water, right? What comes out of the tailpipe of your car? Well, it's a few things, but one of the big ones is carbon dioxide, right? CO2 emissions, okay? And water vapor. So the big thing that's kind of missing here because it's not a chemical, so it doesn't belong in the chemical reaction, but what is kind of the point of all of these reactions? Why do you put gas in your car? Well, you want it to combust, right? Your engine is actually going to make it combust and then use that thermal energy from the burning of the hydrocarbon to be converted into kinetic energy by driving pistons, which, which is going to cause your tires to move. And then you get kinetic energy in the form of your car actually going forward. So what's the whole point of this? Why are we doing this? Because this reaction releases energy. That's the whole point, right? And it doesn't just have to be in the context of a car. Why do you, right? Maybe you're just trying to make heat. Maybe this is propane on a barbecue. The energy could be heat. That's what you want. You don't want motion, right? Either way though, hydrocarbons react with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide, water, vapor, and energy. The oxygen is very important too, right? Um, if you've ever put out a candle by putting a glass over it, you'll notice it uses up the oxygen really quick and then it goes out, right? Most fire extinguishers actually work by doing that. They smother the fire so it can't get oxygen. So it's basically just the conversion of chemical potential energy. That's in there. Hydrocarbons have a lot of chemical potential energy. That's why we use them for fuels. They contain so much potential energy. And when you burn it, it releases that other energy. Often thermal, but often too, we take that thermal that is produced and then turn it into 
kinetic. Right? Kinetic, remember, means motion, the energy of motion. All of these are examples of hydrocarbon combustion reactions, they're called. It's just taking hydrocarbons, burning them to make energy. Okay. An interesting one. These all are kind of in line with what we've been talking about. This is an interesting one you might not have realized is a hydrocarbon combustor. Remember cellular respiration from Science 10? Okay. What was it? You took glucose, C6H12O6, you added oxygen, and you made, hey, you made CO2 and H2O, right? Remember, this is the thing that all living things do to stay alive, right? You, the reason right now you are moving, if you're wiggling your fingers, that's because you're doing cellular respiration. You're having to take the glucose this morning that you got in your breakfast, right? You're breathing in some oxygen. What are you breathing out? CO2. And if you breathe on a mirror, you'll see water vapor, right? You'll see moisture coming out of your breath onto the mirror. That's H2O, right? You're breathing in oxygen. You're using your breakfast to move. And the byproducts are carbon dioxide and water. Okay, so like we said, uh, petroleum, crude oil, right? Two words for the same thing. Contains a large number of different size molecules. It's a hydrocarbon soup. Now, if we take a group of similar size molecules, so like, for example, about, I don't know, C7s to C9s, those are all kind of similar size, which means they'll have a similar boiling point. We kind of just group them and we say, okay, let's call that little group a fraction. They're a fraction of the whole. They're a little piece of it. Now, what is refining? You've probably heard about oil refining, right? If you drive through uh, places like Sherwood Park, you'll see all kinds of, you'll see refineries, right? And you'll even see the main thing we're going to learn about. Okay, which is called a distillation tower, a fractional distillation tower. We'll get there in a sec. Okay, but what is refining? It's just saying, okay, great, we've got this crude oil with all these useful hydrocarbons, but they're not useful for the same things. So we need to separate out the useful parts, right? Think about it again, like I keep going back to football, but if you take a football team and say, okay, uh, all of these players are very talented, they're very good at football, can we just throw them all in at quarterback? Well, no, because that's not what they're all good at, right? Throw them all in on the line. No, right? The wide receivers are going to have a hard time at right guard, okay? But you can, if you can separate them out, if you can pull them out from this big mixture and put them where they need to go, well, then now you've done some refinement of that football team. Refinement literally means uh, make it better, right? Make it better, tweak it, take out the good stuff so that you can use it for what you need to. And this all, again, comes down to each fraction having a different boiling point. So when we heat it, we can separate the fractions. So this is what I was talking about, the atmosphere, the distillation tower, okay? A fractional distillation tower. So we're going to separate out fractions. I'll show you a quick video of how it works, okay? Um, just so you can get a visual for it and we'll come back and we'll just kind of summarize on this page. In this video, you will learn how fractional distillation separates crude oil into useful fractions. Crude oil is the term used to describe unprocessed oil. That is oil that has been taken directly out of the ground, either on land or under the sea. It is an exceptionally valuable resource. It provides us with a great number of hydrocarbons, some of which are useful as fuels, and others are used in the manufacture of many different chemicals and even plastics. However, in the raw form as crude oil, it can be a viscous, dark coloured tar like consistency and the different fractions of hydrocarbons must be separated by fractional distillation for them to be useful. Before we understand how fractional distillation works we should be clear that crude oil is a mixture of hydrocarbons with different chain lengths some being short molecules and some being very long. Intermolecular forces act between molecules and the longer the molecule, the greater the intermolecular force. As you can see here, the small molecules have weaker intermolecular forces, and so will require less energy to break them apart and turn them into a gas. They have a lower boiling point. The longer molecules have greater intermolecular forces. More energy is required, a higher temperature will be needed to evaporate these molecules. They have a higher boiling point. Now we understand how chain length is related to the boiling point of a molecule, let us look at how this method works. As you can see, crude oil is heated up to a high temperature outside of the fractionating column. The hot crude oil, now mostly in vapour form, is pumped into the column. The column has a heat gradient and is very hot at the bottom, going cooler as we move up to the top. 
even at the very bottom of the column, where the temperature is still high, some long chain molecules with high boiling points begin to condense back into a liquid. These are collected at the bottom of the column. The rest of the molecules start to rise up the column, making their way through bubble caps in each tray. The bubble caps slow down the rate of the rising vapour, and eventually the vapours get too cool, condense and are collected as liquids in the trays. Small molecules have low boiling points, and so condense much higher in the column, where the temperature is cooler still. As you can see, hydrocarbons with similar boiling points are collected in the same tray, and this is why they are known as fractions. They are mixtures of hydrocarbons with similar boiling points. Each fraction has some important uses. Some examples of fractions are petrol, useful as a fuel for cars, naphtha, used in the manufacture of chemicals, kerosene as aircraft fuel, diesel oil, used as fuels for vans, cars and lorries, and bitumen, a mixture of large chain hydrocarbons used to lay roads. Now, at the end of this video, you should understand that crude oil is a mixture of important hydrocarbons, and that fractional distillation is the method used to separate crude oil into useful fractions with similar boiling point. You should understand that small chain molecules are collected at the top of the column since they have lower boiling points, and larger chain molecules are collected further down the column as these have higher boiling points. Okay, so what's the main idea here? Well, take your crude oil, your petroleum down here, right? Heat it up so high that pretty much everything boils. No matter what its boiling point is, you're gonna basically turn it into a gas, right? With, except for the very biggest one. But most of the stuff is going to get boiled here so that it's all gas, basically. Okay, so here we boil pretty much everything except the very, very biggest hydrocarbons, okay? Remember, bigger hydrocarbon, higher boiling point, so the harder it is to actually turn that into a gas. So the biggest, biggest carbons, like C30s and higher, okay, those will not boil and they will right away, we can pull them out and say, okay, we'll use that into other stuff, right? These are things like asphalt, uh, greases, wax, right? Those are the biggest things we can kind of pull out and say, okay, they're not gonna boil, let's pull them out and use them for what they're good for. Okay, already, look, we've pulled something out of our hydrocarbon soup we've pulled something out that now can be used for a more specific purpose. Okay, now we take all of that stuff. Now everything again, it's turned from hydrocarbon soup into now a hydrocarbon gas. So all the gas is there, but here's the key point, right? As we go from here to here, okay, as we go from the bottom up to the top, the temperature decreases. This tower gets cooler and cooler as you go up. So tower, gets cooler as we rise, right? And so think about it. If it's getting cooler, eventually we're gonna go back down below the boiling points of some of the hydrocarbons. And what are they gonna do? They're going to condense, which is just the opposite of boiling. So if boiling was going from a liquid to a gas, well, now they're gonna go from a gas to a liquid. And then what do we do? Well, we say, okay, at this level, we want to grab so like say at this level, this is where we're gonna get our jet fuel. So what do we do? We put a little essentially collection plate and we allow the, so for diesel, for example, you would pull out at this level. Why? Because at this level, right, we've now reached a, it's gotten cool enough that heavier hydrocarbons, larger ones with more carbons, again, that word, that they start to condense. Again, that word condense means go from gas to liquid, okay? So it's getting cooler and cooler. We've boiled everything and then we let it all cool off, but it gets cooler and cooler. So up here, the stuff that had a pretty high boiling point will now be below its boiling point and it will turn to a liquid and we can pull it out and send it off for what we need that stuff for, right? And then the stuff that's left over keeps on rising and it gets cooler and cooler and cooler and cooler. And eventually some smaller hydrocarbons start to turn into liquid again, right? And we can pull those out. And then it keeps rising and rising and rising and getting cooler and cooler and cooler. And then even smaller hydrocarbons will actually uh, end up going below their boiling point and turning into liquid. And we can pull out, you see here, this is gasoline, right? This is where we actually pull out the components of gasoline. So it's about the C7s to the C10s, right? Mostly octane is the main component of our gasoline. 
Okay, so as it goes up, lighter hydrocarbons condense into liquids and get pulled out for what they're useful for. So see what we're doing? We're using their boiling points to separate them. We boil it all and then we cool it down as it goes up. And when it gets cool enough, right, these are the temperatures here where certain stuff will start to go from gas back into liquid. Once that happens, we just collect the liquid and pump it off and say, okay, here you go. Send this over to the people that make jet fuel and send this to the people that make propane, right? Because so then once we get up to the very top, these are where the lightest, the smallest, I'm going to stop using that word heavier. I'm going to go to larger and smaller. Sorry. Okay. And then up here, we have the lightest hydrocarbons, or the, sorry, the smallest hydrocarbons even now start to condense out. Okay. Now, remember, there's some of these that even at room temperature, remember some even at like minus 180 or whatever would still be a gas, okay? So those will never obviously turn into a liquid in this thing, but that's okay. We can just then collect them at the top as gases, right? Collect the smallest ones like methane and ethane and propane and even butane, right? Just collect those at as gases. And then if you want, you can go uh, refine them through other processes. So what's the main idea, okay? Essentially... Again, it's called fractional distillation because we're going to take the fractions and distill them out. Okay, petroleum's completely vaporized at first, then it's pumped into the bottom. The hot gases rise, but the tower gets cooler the higher up the gases go. And so since more carbons means a higher boiling point, the bigger hydrocarbons will condense at lower levels, right? They turn back into liquids. Once they're liquid, it's easy to pull it out. We can pull them out and separate them. And on the other side of the coin, fewer carbons means a lower boiling point. So the smaller hydrocarbons, right, will reach higher levels before they become a liquid again. And then there can be separated up there. So each level is kept at a temperature that is just below the boiling point of whatever hydrocarbon you want to extract, right? So if, so if you're looking for C9s to C12s, you put it just around the boiling point, uh, you put it just below the boiling point of C9, and then all the C9s to C10s will kind of turn into liquids here, and then you can pull them out when they turn to liquid. So this essentially just allows us to sort the petroleum into the different hydrocarbons we want, as they all can be useful on their own, but for very different things. All together, crude oil, you can't do much with it, right? It's got so many useful parts, but when it's all mixed together like that, you really do need to separate it out to, uh, to let the parts do the job they are good at. Just a quick note on boiling point and number of carbons. Remember, it's number of carbons, not number of carbons in the parent chain. So okay, so just remember that boiling point depends on the total number of carbons, not just the carbons in the parent chain. Why do I say that? because sometimes they'll try to trick you up by saying which would have a higher boiling point. Because they'll say, compare the boiling points of these two things, right? And students remember, they were paying attention, they go, okay, more carbons equals higher boiling point. And I know that hex is six and hept is seven. So, okay, seven is bigger than six, so heptane has more carbons and must have a higher boiling point. But be careful, remember, this just says the number of carbons in the parent chain. Which one actually has more carbons total? I'll draw them out really quick so we can see. Okay, there's hex, ane, all single bonds. On the third carbon, there's an ethyl group. F means two. Okay, and I could fill it in with hydrogens, but since we're just comparing number of carbons here, that's not going to matter. Let's do heptane really quick. So hept, a little more straightforward, just seven carbons. Right, no branches or anything, just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons in one straight chain, right? I've covered everything. So yes, I'm leaving out the hydrogens, but... Remember, we're just comparing number of carbons for the boiling point here. Okay, take a look. Do they, does heptane actually have more carbons? Aha, hexane has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, because that branch has two, right? Whereas heptane has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So these are both named, right? They're both drawn correctly. It's not like I made a mistake or anything. It's just that the total number of carbons is what determines boiling point, so we have to include branches in that. So 3-ethylhexane would actually have a higher boiling point than heptane. So higher boiling point, lower. 
okay? So just don't fall for that mistake. Another step that's kind of done in refining hydrocarbons, just making them a little bit better at what we are using them for, is uh, something called cracking or catalytic cracking, okay? Essentially, we crack molecules and we take like a big molecule, crack it up into smaller molecules, and then we often even take these smaller molecules and just try to reform them into a shape, into a chemical shape that is no different in terms of what makes it up, but it's just put together differently. So like, for example, branched alkanes, branched alkanes have higher ignition temperatures than unbranched alkanes with the same number of carbons. What do we mean by that? Picture, uh, picture butane. Again, I'm leaving out the hydrogens, but butane versus methyl propane. Okay, both have four carbons. If, if you drew in the hydrogens, you would see actually the same number of hydrogens as well. Okay, so essentially they look the same. They've got the same carbons, even got the same hydrogens. However, because of the shape of this one, because of the way it's bonded, this will burn higher, hotter, and cleaner. So if you've got the choice between butane and methylpropane, depending on what you're using it for, you often will want to just break this off, go crack, right? And then reform it by sticking it there to make this. Okay, because this will have a higher ignition temperature, which is sometimes something you want, sometimes not. Okay, so again, it depends on what you're trying to do. Okay, natural gas, right? AKA methane, more or less, right? We kind of use those words somewhat interchangeably. Okay, uh, they basically, you take natural gas, methane, you do processing to remove stuff that you don't want. Maybe you want for something else, but you don't want it for what you're using the natural gas for, okay? Remove the ethane, remove the butane, hydrogen sulfide, anything else. You must remove H2S, right? H2S is actually very dangerous. If any of your parents work out at site, they most likely had to go undergo serious training to know what to do. They come into contact with H2S, okay? Uh, and the last kind of note we're going to talk about here is polymerization and how we use it for making plastics. Okay, so what is a plastic? It's actually just a bunch of small molecules joined together into very long chains. So we take small molecules, we join them to form a long chain called a polymer. And when I say long, I mean really long. Like I'm not talking dec decane. I'm talking like thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of carbons long. Okay, essentially infinite. We call it a polymer. So poly means many, mer means parts. Well, that makes sense. It's many parts, okay? We take these polymers and we can put it together into plastics. That's essentially what plastics are, okay? So polymerization is the process of taking small hydrocarbons, monomers, mono means one, right? Uh, you might have learned in social class, a monopoly is when one company controls something. Mono, one company, monopoly, right? A monocle is just one glass instead of two. <laughs> to make long hydrocarbons, okay? How do we do it? We take a small one, we take a monomer, like for example, ethene. This would be our monomer. And what do we do? We turn it into polyethylene. That would be our polymer, okay? Polyethene is, polyethene, or sometimes called polyethylene, is the by far the most commonly used uh, polymer. It's everywhere, okay? Pretty much, chances are, if you go find something plastic, it's made of polyethylene. Okay, it's grocery bags, shampoo bottles, kids toys, tons of stuff, okay? Polyethylene is everywhere. So what do we do? We take, like it said, ethene. Hey, we know how to draw ethene. Ethene is gonna be two carbons. Ene means double bond. And then we've covered the two carbons, we've covered the double bond, so fill in with hydrogens. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So this is ethene. Now I've drawn two of them next to each other because what are you gonna do? See this bond here? What if you took it and you used it to stick onto there, okay? And then you didn't stop there. You took that one and ripped it off and stuck it onto another ethene. Stuck it onto another carbon, another ethane. And then you can probably see where this is going. You're gonna take that one, rip it off, stick it onto another ethene. And you keep going and going and going in this chain. And eventually what you make is polyethene, right? You take a bunch of ethenes, break their double bonds, use it to attach them to one another, and then you've made, right, after long enough, you've started to make this thing, polyethene, right? And this just means it could go on forever and go on forever that way. So you use special chemical reactions to kind of reform it into chains of molecules. Here's another example, polypropene. Hey, propene, what does that make you think of? Well, what do you think was the monomer used to make polypropene? If, poly, if ethene was the monomer used to make the polymer polyethene, what do you think is used to make polypropene? 
you guessed it, propene. Can you see uh, where prop where prop came from in here? Can you kind of see? Remember, prop means three. Well, look at this. We took a propene, right? We broke a double bond to connect it to another propene that used to be there, right? Broke that things to do that. So we took a monomer and turned it into a polymer. Again, this can go on for pretty much as long as you want it to. What's the issue with these? Well, these molecules are huge, which means they are very, very hard to break down. Couple that with the fact that nothing has really, that most hydrocarbons kind of occur naturally and there is a natural process for breaking them down. Plastics, obviously we take these special reactions to form them and there's really no natural process to break them down. So as you might know, right, a lot of our oceans are filling up with huge amounts of plastic waste that will more or less never go away, right? Unless we uh, pull it out ourselves, right? And find something to do with it. So plastic can take thousands of years to break down. Um, and some plastics essentially just will never break down ever. So in the ocean we get, so I'll show you a quick video kind of talking about this idea about the uh, degradability of different plastics and the implications that kind of has for us and our responsible use of organic chemistry, right? Or perhaps you could think of it as our irresponsible use sometimes of your, of organic chemistry. This is the story of three plastic bottles, empty and discarded. Their journeys are about to diverge with outcomes that impact nothing less than the fate of the planet. But they weren't always this way. To understand where these bottles end up, we must first explore their origins. The heroes of our story were conceived in this oil refinery. The plastic in their bodies was formed by chemically bonding oil and gas molecules together to make monomers. In turn, these monomers were bonded into long polymer chains to make plastic, in the form of millions of pellets. Those were melted at manufacturing plants and reformed in molds to create the resilient material that makes up the triplets' bodies. Machines filled the bottles with sweet, bubbly liquid, and they were then wrapped, shipped, bought, opened, consumed, and unceremoniously discarded. And now here they lie, poised at the edge of the unknown. Bottle one, like hundreds of millions of tons of his plastic brethren, ends up in a landfill. This huge dump expands each day as more trash comes in and continues to take up space. As plastics sit there being compressed amongst layers of other junk, rainwater flows through the waste and absorbs the water-soluble compounds it contains, and some of those are highly toxic. Together, they create a harmful stew called leachate, which can move into groundwater, soil, and streams, poisoning ecosystems and harming wildlife. It can take bottle one an agonizing 1,000 years to decompose. Bottle 2's journey is stranger, but unfortunately no happier. He floats on a trickle that reaches a stream, a stream that flows into a river, and a river that reaches the ocean. After months lost at sea, he's slowly drawn into a massive vortex where trash accumulates, a place known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Here, the ocean's currents have trapped millions of pieces of plastic debris, this is one of five plastic-filled gyres in the world's seas, places where the pollutants turn the water into a cloudy plastic soup. Some animals, like seabirds, get entangled in the mess. They, and others, mistake the brightly colored plastic bits for food. Plastic makes them feel full when they're not, so they starve to death, and pass the toxins from the plastic up the food chain. For example, it's eaten by lanternfish. The lanternfish are eaten by squid. The squid are eaten by tuna. And the tuna are eaten by us. And most plastics don't biodegrade, which means they're destined to break down into smaller and smaller pieces called microplastics, which might rotate in the sea eternally. But Bottle 3 is spared the cruel purgatories of his brothers. A truck brings him to a plant where he and his companions are squeezed flat and compressed into a block. Okay, this sounds pretty bad too, but hang in there. It gets better. The blocks are shredded into tiny pieces, which are washed and melted 
so they become the raw materials that can be used again. As if by magic, Bottle 3 is now ready to be reborn as something completely new. For this bit of plastic with such humble origins, suddenly, the sky is the limit. All right, and that actually wraps up our organic chemistry week and our uh, chemistry unit overall. So if you're looking for practice, you can do the topic four section of the, um, of the practice work for this week. Okay, it mostly deals with fractional distillation and the boiling points of hydrocarbons. Once you've tried that, if you're feeling really good, you can do the summative assessment for this week. So that's the check-in for the week, okay? I won't be posting over spring break, so I'll see you after. Enjoy your week, okay? Um, now is a good opportunity to catch up on other stuff. If you're missing anything, okay, uh, takes time to do it. But other than that, have a great break. And don't forget, if you ever need me for questions on Flex or anything, or even if you just want to pop into Flex to talk, okay, I could always use some human contact. I've got the Google Meet. I've got email. You can call the school, ask for my extension, whatever works best for you. Okay, thanks.